Ana Maria Tamendi. Oh my God, Ana, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And thank you so much for being here today. Um, Ana, I want to first talk to tell people how I met you. Um, Ana Maria and I, we went to school together in Santa Rosa de Lima, Caracas, Venezuela. We met each other when we were 14 years old. We were doing the math right now to figure out that. And since I met you, Anna, I was fascinated not only with your talent as a pianist, you are one of the smartest person I have ever met, and the most humble person about it, which is incredible. I think that uh, in this interview, what people are gonna see is that not only you are a human being with a high um, intellectual IQ, you have an incredible emotional IQ. And I wonder if music, complements that if music balance you out so Anna tell us who is Anna Maria Otamendi oh thank you Vanessa you're so sweet I'm very happy to be here it's so wonderful to reconnect with you I have such mem fun memories of you when we're back in school and this is a really beautiful opportunity so thank you thank you for inviting me um you're you're too kind <laughs> <laughs> there you go the humble Anna there you go <laughs> Uh, okay, so who am I? Well, I am from Venezuela, like Vanessa, and I came to the States when I was 21 to do my master's. Um, I am an engineer, mostly for family pressure. Back when I was in Venezuela, uh, being a musician wasn't really a thing you did. How are you going to support yourself as a musician? So, of course, my parents were like, no, 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 you need to have a second career, you need to have something else just in case. So I went to school for engineering uh, just because I like geology and I saw a career called geophysics. Wow. I don't know what it was, no clue. And the funny thing is when I talk to my friends who went to college with me, they all tell me the same thing. Yeah, I, I didn't know what geophysics was. It sounded like it was something with the earth and I could make money working on the oil industry. So I studied that, which is hilarious. <laughs> uh, but in the last year of my undergrad, I was so busy. I mean, I managed to do piano and engineering together for the, almost the full five years. But the last year I was so busy doing my thesis, I was in a lab all day. I didn't have a lot of time to practice and I really felt there was something missing inside of me. And um, a teacher came from the States to give some master classes in Venezuela and we really clicked. She really liked me and I liked her a lot. And she said, you wanna come to the States and study with me? And I told her I would love to, but I have no money. And <laughs> But I can find you a scholarship, it's not a problem. And I told my parents, they were furious. Um, they're like, what, what? year? What year is this, Anna? Because this will be important because this is how Venez this is Venezuela has been going through like major political and economical changes. When, when was it when someone comes from the United States and says, we'll take you, come to the United States? What year was that? Do you remember? 2003. Wow, um, okay. I was right at the beginning of this horrible, presidency and if you can call that a presidency whatever you um, want to call it <laughs> whatever you want to call it yes it was right at the beginning i already knew that venezuela was going down i mean you could see that from miles away from the time he won and i i wanted to leave anyway i was going to leave either to do a phd in geophysics or to do a masters in music and i just decided to give music a shot i thought you know i can always go back to engineering you're not too old if you're 25 to go back and do a master's. I'm like, whatever, I'm just gonna go and do a master's in music. I was 21 at the time. My parents were furious, they cut me off. They said, we're not gonna give you any money. You're on your own. I'm like, fine, I have a scholarship. I'll buy, if you want me to come visit, then you need to help me with the ticket. Other than that, I don't need any <gasps> Ana Maria Otamendi, oh my, I love, I love this. Okay, so you come to the States, uh, what's, okay, so then what happens from there? Uh, I was very lucky. I've, I've, I've encountered really wonderful people along my path. And I had a wonderful teacher that was in Wisconsin. And I did in my master's. And after that, I did an artist certificate. And I was going to actually go into conducting. I, I got into a conducting program. But my father got really sick. And my mother was by herself. I'm an only child. And my mom told me I can't deal with this anymore. He had Alzheimer's and it got to a point which is really really bad and she was on a, on a nervous breakdown basically so wow. i decided to go back to venezuela and you know so i find i'll go back for a year and then i want to come back to the states and do a doctorate so i went and it ended up being a wonderful year i got a job at the venezuelan symphony orchestra i met wonderful people there it was just very serendipitous 
um, the pianist had just left and I was, I, I had played a few concerts with the concert master. So he recommended me for the job. They auditioned me. I got the job. It was great. Back then still Venezuela was okay. That was 2007 at that point. Um, and then my father, he passed away. I'm sorry to hear that. I actually remember your father, your, correct me if I'm wrong, Anna, I think you, your parents were older when they had you, right? Yes. yes I remember, father. I remember your dad would come to school and we would all be like, wow, your father, I have to mention that because sometimes people have this myth that when you come from older parents that, you know, you can be a prodigy child. So we always wonder, we're like, that's probably why Anna is so smart because her parents are much older because you, they were much older than the rest of us, you know, compared to our parents. At, that was the norm at the time. So, yeah, so, oh, so I'm sorry to hear that about your dad. Continue, Anna. Uh, no, that's okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, my father was incredibly supportive all throughout my childhood and my teenage years. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I, he passed away. I came back to the States. I did a doctor at the University of Michigan. I decided to go in a slightly different route. Uh, up until then, my, my whole education was in solo piano. And then I heard about this thing called collaborative piano. And I was like, what is this? I love playing with people. I, I'm a very social person. I like you know, being with people. And as a pianist, you're, you're practicing by yourself all day. You're basically locked up in a room by yourself. And I heard about this and some people told me, yeah, you know, actually you have a lot more career opportunities because there are many different things that you can do as a pianist. And I, I, I thought that was a great idea. So I ended up doing a doctor in collaborative piano, which is what I'm currently doing. So you can make money playing yeah. the piano because there is a reason why I want to talk to Anna because there might be other kids with the same, uh, you know, and other parents with the same because when you, at that time in Venezuela, you were absolutely right. When I told my father I wanted to study economics, he's like, no, you're going to be an engineer. And Anna, did you go to... <laughs> <laughs> Which university did you go in Venezuela? Where did you graduate from Venezuela? Simon Bolivar. La Simon Bolivar, which I have to tell everyone, this is one of the top universities in, I mean, incredible university. My brother also graduated from there and he's uh, a nerd. I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna say it. <laughs> so, so a nerd. So, I brother study. My brother went to, see, to the same university and he's an electronic engineer. So, is, and now, are, were your parents musicians or how did you get into piano? You start, you start playing when you're 12. Who gets you into piano? Like how did you discover it? When you were five. Okay. So who gets you into say, this is a piano, Anna, or was it you? Are both of your parents musicians? How does it work? No, my parents are not musicians. My father was an amateur musician. So he loved music. He played the guitar. He had some lessons. He's mostly self-taught but he was a huge classical music fan. So my father, he could, he could listen to anything on the radio and tell you that's Beethoven symphony number no. three. This is the third movement, the skirts of love. I mean, he had an incredible ear and he had a huge collection of music. He went to concerts every week. So he was, he was a huge fan of classical music. He adored classical music. And I have two older half brothers. They're twice my age. And he wanted them to be musicians. They didn't like it. So ever since I was born, he had this idea that he wanted me to play the piano. So they gave me a little piano when I was three and I adored that thing. I played with it all the time. So, and I love to sing, I love to dance. So obviously music was something that I really liked from the very beginning. So by the time I turned five, they brought me to this piano teacher and she, she gave me a test and she said, yeah, you should, you should have her. I think she'll be an okay pianist. <laughs> and then Ana Maria Tamendi. <laughs> Anna, I have a question. What is the difference? Um, there is a very famous con Venezuelan conductor. I don't know his name. Dudamel. Right? Gustavo Dudamel. Yes. Thank you so much for that. And he, what is a conductor? Like how hard it is? Because I know you probably play more than one instrument and, you know, God knows that you can do your own rock band <laughs> on your own. What is, a con what is the difference? Like fast. What is the difference between a conductor? Because... Oh, what did you see is this? And I'm thinking, what do, I mean, like, what is the value of a conductor? Because I am pretty sure a lot of people have the same question. What do you do when you're a conductor? On an, and what do you have to know? Like how high in music you need to know, to put it that way? Well, I mean, that's a very valid question. I think 
their conductors didn't really exist until the 19th century. Before then, orchestra played by themselves and the concertmaster, who is the, the first violin, uh, he was the one who would lead the orchestra. Other than that, the orchestra, you could even have operas without a conductor, but they're the operas that didn't have a conductor. So it's not until really like the middle, late 19th century that conductor became a thing. Uh, I know a lot of people have the same questions, like this is just somebody waving a stick, what is this person doing? <laughs> I'm going like this, yeah, that's all what you see. <laughs> right, so the role of the conductor is, you, the conductor needs to know everybody's part. So if you're an oboist, you know your oboe part and that's it. And that's all you can see in front of you. If you're a violinist, all you can see is the violin part and you're just playing the violin part. The conductor has this huge score, it's called full score, in which you have everybody's part, one under the other. Wow. So, right. So the role of the conductor is you need to know the music better than everybody else in the orchestra. You need to know how the different parts go together uh, which part is more important than which at any given point in the music. So you need to have a pretty clear idea of how the music should go, the, the structure of the music, the form of the music, and then the gestures, basically what the gestures do is they show the orchestra when to play and how to play. So if you give a gesture that is really big, you're telling the orchestra play loudly and play mm. fast, you're telling play fast. If you give them a gesture that is soft like this, you're telling play, play beautifully, play softly, play slowly. So the gesture in the hand actually involves a, quite a, 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 an important amount of technique. So they um, have a language, I guess, that yeah. everyone understands. Yeah. How, in, you, just, you just give me goosebumps. How incredible to have the language or the ability of being, basically you're just like the manager, to put yeah. it like in a exactly. business term. Exactly. Are, yes. Hire here, hire that, and he needs to have a, a, an incredible energy that, and you have to respect this person. So, wow, Anna, you need to be a conductor. You need to be <laughs> a female Venezuelan version conductor. That's awesome. Have you met uh, any famous uh, conductor? Have you, Have you met? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I used to work in opera for a few years. I, I worked at the Houston Opera, Houston Grand Opera, which is probably the third largest opera house in the states. And I had a chance to work with some really great conductors over there and to learn from them. Uh, I know Gustavo. I don't know him well, but I do know him. Um, he's so you've been in the same, you have breathing, you have like have the same air with him. Like I know you, I'm, that's really uh, nice, nice, uh, nice. Uh, I mean, the Venezuelan musical cycle is not that big. It's pretty small. So people, people tend to know each other. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a completely different world. And it's harder than it looks to be. A you person. know, I, 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 so I, I went yesterday and I was watching your videos when, and I'm going to put, you know, your YouTube here. And I mean, you go so fast with your both hands and the coordination between right and left plus, and then the, I guess there were other musicians putting comments. Oh, but you shouldn't use, which I don't know what they're talking about, but I was thinking, how do they know? What are they talking about? I guess when you are a pianist, like a high, you know, like professional, when you see someone else playing, you're kind of like, no, she missed that, she missed that. Other than that, everyone is just enjoying the music. So I guess they're able to see like the technical part. But people yeah. like me that just want to relax and I think piano, piano, actually, I know piano is your favorite, obviously, instrument. What other instruments, Anna? Which one, which instrument, Anna, do you think is the best one to start when you have, like me, a four and a half? Uh, you know, I have a toddler. She's four and a half, and obviously I want to get her into music. I, I know basic, like how to read music, like basic, happy birthday, things like that. Maybe I can do, like, you know, Cielito Linda, like something like middle school kids will do. How do I... How do I, and I don't have a piano, I have the little, IP, you know, piano iPad. How do you, what do you recommend, Anna, to the moms like me that see you and they're like, oh, I want my child to, you know, do this, what she's doing. How do you do it? Or you think you're born or you think you, are you a born musician or can you make yourself a musician? Or is it a combination of both? I think it's a combination of both. I think there's some, certain children that have a, a very clear affinity towards music since they're very young. Um, so what I would say is I would introduce children to music. I think piano is a great first instrument. It's the easiest instrument at the beginning to actually get some sounds. As you go 
later it's it's one of the hardest together with the violin probably and i mean they're all they're all different and all difficult in different ways but to begin with it's a great instrument because you can produce sound very easily um, and you can actually learn how to play something that sounds like music fairly <laughs> quickly in a violin it'll take you at least seven years before you can play something decent. <gasps> wow it's very 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 hard um, so, and I think at that age when they're so young, they're, where their motor coordination is not fully developed, the piano actually gives them a chance to, to produce music quickly and also to learn how to read music and to learn to coordinate both hands. So it develops a whole host of abilities that then later on, if when they're six or seven, they go to a concert and they see, oh my God, I want to play the cello. You're like, fine, play the cello, but you already have a musical background that is I want my daughter to tell me that ma I want to play the cello be like (gasps) what I would do is like I would play them I mean some symphonic music is great for kids so you play them ballet music Tchaikovsky you can play them like Firebird Stravinsky something that is is fast and it's exciting it'll get them uh, really thrilled to listen to, to classical music I would recommend uh, when, whenever we have live concerts again, I don't know when that will be. Um, and if you see that the orchestra is doing uh, a piece like this, you know, Beethoven five, or as I said, some, some Tchaikovsky, something that is very easily accessible. Um, I would maybe before the concert, like a week before the concert, play little excerpts at home and tell them, oh, listen, this, this instrument here is called the cello and this other instrument here is called the oboe and listen to the melody here. And you do it just Ooh. a little time. So then when you take the child to the concert, the music is something they're already used to. So they'll be able to appreciate it a lot more. And at that age, I mean, they're so young, four and a half, you know, their attention span is, is short. So maybe don't stay for the whole concert, stay for one of the two halves and then go home. That half an hour is probably more than enough. But that said, great. Uh, I, I try to get a lot of uh, live music. Obviously in this pandemic, it's a little bit harder, but I try to put a lot of YouTube videos of right. live music. And I don't even tell where I watch it. I, I love it and I enjoy it. And I think what is important about music and that has that helped me, I, I took uh, organ lessons a little bit of yeah i was more like an organ player than a piano which i don't know why the which organ is it's a little bit more difficult too because you have the top the bottom and i mean i have forgotten a lot but yeah. what what I, and i never and I, I hated it i remember my mom taking me to the music classes and i would be like oh here we come again and they were so magical now as an adult i have appreciated and i say wow it's incredible how music has helped me with my patients, uh, be a mom, and people are gonna be like, how is she relating music to all this? During this pandemic, I've, uh, like everyone, I was getting very stressed and anxious, and I, I, it's very hard just to watch it to be, and I, the beauty about music, so I started reading about music, and when you play music, your whole brain gets eliminated, and it's so, it's actually a great way to relax, because you cannot do anything other than just play the instrument, even if it's just doing a beat. Ding, 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 ding. And I realized and I said, wow, music should be something that we should implement all the time. And we don't, we put it as an elective. Oh yes, you know, she can play the piano. And of course, it's, it is expensive, Anna. Is, is it expensive to get into music? Like instruments are expensive, but there are a lot of good things on YouTube. So what do you recommend to the moms there that, they don't have the, like, I don't have the time or the money to go to a professional musician. What do you recommend those little tips as moms? Like, you know, how do we get a kid into music at home? Without, without hiring a music teacher, you mean? Yes, yes. As a regular mom like me. Um, okay. So there's a few things you can do. If you really want your child to study music, I know a lot of parents are afraid of buying a piano. It's expensive, you know, uh, even a... Um, However, a lot of times you can find pianos on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace for like $200, $300. A lot of times some people will actually tell you just take the piano, just have to pay for the move, which is not cheap because piano movers probably charge you between $150, $200 to move a piano from one place to another. But uh, you don't need to spend $5,000 on a new instrument. Something else you can do is a lot of piano stores, they rent instruments. They rent keyboards. 
and they rent pianos. So if, if it's something you, you have no idea if your child is gonna like music and you don't wanna go into this huge investment, just rent a keyboard for something like 30 bucks a month, at least for the first few months until you see is maybe my child really likes music, you know, then it's worth buying a keyboard. can buy a pretty decent frozen uh, are you now okay. i got you i got you yes <laughs> so um i was uh, yeah i was just saying you don't need to, to do this huge upfront investment and I, I wouldn't do it honestly until you see if the child actually enjoys doing it or not that's actually um, a really good idea anna going to a store rent it uh because that way you know i believe that when you work with children too you need to give them a little bit enjoy them and because they get bored so fast obviously as a parent you want to get the best instrument and the biggest the, the chinese I mean, right and then then they don't appreciate it then in two weeks later they'll be like nope i don't want to do this so that's a that's a great idea and, and and my final question before i let you go how long does it take a pianist to get to your level when you when how long okay how many hours do you practice a day let's, let's start from there okay I think, well, that, that's an interesting question. You know, there's a, there's a, a huge authority in psychology. His name is uh, Anders Ericsson. He is the, the guy who came up, I don't know if you've heard about this. There's a, this thing called the 10,000 hour rule. No, but I'm going to put it, I'm going to put it on for everyone to read. He has a fascinating book called Peak. Um, and he studied a bunch of, of musicians chess players athletes um i'm trying to think if it was some so basically people that need to practice something a lot in order to become very good at what they're doing and his rule of thumb was basically it takes somebody ten thousand hours of practice to wow. become master but that this is to become like you know a professional like a really 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 good pianist or violinist or chess player or swimmer or whatever it is that in, you want. in your lifetime i'm guessing yeah. <laughs> well, before you can, you can call yourself a master. Now, the problem is, it's not just 10,000 hours. It's 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, which means if you're just at the piano kind of, you know, joking around, that doesn't count. It needs to be <laughs> good practice with somebody that can guide you and tell you, no, this is what you need to do. You do this here, you do that there. So that's a long time. That's a long time. Cloud, here I'm talking about becoming a master. So that doesn't mean that you need to put 10,000 hours before you can play something nicely on the piano. No, of course not. But it's a, good, it's a good goal to tell your child, look, you'll get there. You'll yeah, need... it's going to take a while, I think. And, I, and that's why I tell, I tell people a lot. And I tell the same thing to my students. I, even students that are here, I have mostly graduate students. And I tell them, if there's anything else in the world that makes you happy, go do that. But if music is the only thing in the world that could possibly make you a happy person, then be a musician. What a great advice. Anna, have you ever had a student that had no hope? That you were like, get out. Me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that you were like, you, you, or do you feel that we all as human beings have music inside? I think, I think all of us have music in some way or another. I don't think everybody can be a concert pianist or everybody can be a professional musician, no. Actually, the, the percentage is, it's, I mean, the problem is that people think I want to be a musician because I want to be that person who is touring around the world playing concerts. And I think that's the 0.01% of musicians. And the thing is that there's so many other careers in music that can make somebody happy. So you just have to know yourself and know, I mean, I love, you know, somebody may love working with children. That's not something I particularly enjoy doing. I do it, I did it for a while and it's not, it's not something that comes naturally, but you give me somebody who's already 16 and then I'm like completely on my element after, and I have students, I have a student here that actually is older than me that's doing her doctorate. Um, and I love that. And I always knew I wanted to work in the university that had always been my dream since I was young. I just, I guess didn't know what I wanted to t teach at the university. But um, I, I think there's many different types of careers that you can do with music successfully, making a good living and enjoying what you're doing. But I, I would say that it needs to be your absolute passion. However, that doesn't mean that people cannot study music. And I think music helps your brain develop in many different ways. 
Um, I have a lot of friends that used to be musicians that quickly switched into coding and now are very successful computer software engineers making a ton of money. Uh, and I've heard this in many different careers. A musician and math are two things that can go together. Oh, you know? the, the patterns involved. It's just Absolutely. funny because people don't understand that. I love math, of course. Absolutely. How math and patterns and music and all this together. Because one of the things, the benefits of myself when I was, you know, studying, uh, it was like if I wasn't copied from you when I was in high school. <laughs> <laughs> because Ana Maria, Ana Maria was good in everything, in all of, in all of the subjects. But um, no, but seriously, uh, with music, I, I see that math runs faster. I like to do math problems listening to classical music. That's it. Like I think, and yeah. I, I feel that when people say like, oh, yeah, no, I use classical music to study. You're like, how? But the important part, at least for me, is just to relax and just have the music just basically as a guidance. That's how I study. Not to worry about it. And I think like the, what, I, what I have seen from classical music when you're studying, the way how I feel like it has relaxed me, is that there are patterns on the song, right? And you go the climax and then you go down. So I feel that kind of helps your brain to relax. Like, make like a wave i don't know if that makes sense but that's how that's how i feel that piano connects and like i said before when you play the piano your whole brain is activated there's a difference between playing an instrument and listening to the instrument and i just think that um i want to do a little bit more research on music therapy because i think music therapy is something that everyone should do and Anna just to wrap up tell us a little bit about your project um, I wanna you know I want I want you to have um, the voice so tell us about the project that you're working right now about the collaborative oh okay um, I have a, a couple projects I mean right now that I had a lot of concerts and they all got cancelled of course at least until the end of the, this year but I have a few recording projects in the, in the works. I now recording is one of the few things that you can do. So I have a recording project with my trio, I have a recording project with a soprano, and I have a recording project with a bassoonist, one of my colleagues here at the university. Um, I have a summer festival called the Collaborative Piano Institute that is basically, it's a one of a kind. There's nothing else like it here in the States. It's a three week summer program that is just for collaborative pianists. And you're probably thinking, again, what's a collaborative pianist? It's basically a pianist that works with other people. So it could be a pianist with a singer or a pianist with a trio, a pianist with strings, Ooh. a pianist with woodwinds, a pianist in an orchestra, a pianist with a choir. So it's basically a piano plus anything. So this three week festival is geared towards students, um, normally uh, college and above. We, we have had a couple of high school students in the past um, and basically we bring what, so some of the best uh, collaborative pianists in the States uh, for three weeks. Ideally, we wanted to bring them here to LSU this past summer, we did it online because of the pandemic. Um, so that's, that's exciting, it's something, it's one of my passion projects. Um, and my trio, which is, um, it's really exciting. It's funny how sometimes the, the pandemic has brought a few good things. Uh, the violinist of my trio lives in New Mexico and the cellist lives in Wisconsin. So as wow. you can imagine, every time that we have to play, we have to get together for at least a week to rehearse really intensely and then present concerts. And we have discovered now, because of, of technology, there's a program that allows us to rehearse each one of us in our, in our different cities and we can actually play in real time. It's quite amazing. So we wow. rehearse. I know, it's incredible. So that's one of the few things that have been good about this pandemic which is really exciting because now we can rehearse every week, which is something we had never been able to do. For, who, for who's not watching right now and they're just listening, Ana Maria has a huge smile. You can see how happy she is with this project. I love it, Ana. And I want to thank you so much for your time today. Um, I, I can tell you that I admire you. I, I feel very, very privileged and very lucky that I was able to go to school with you and then reconnect today. Anna, thank you again so much for being here today. Um, we're gonna say goodbye, and I'm gonna, just like in, at the beginning I put uh, your music, I wanna end this podcast with another 10 to 15 seconds of your masterpiece. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you, Vanessa, for having me here. I really, I'm so glad to see you again, and I know this blog is gonna be wonderful, and I feel very, very lucky to have been invited. 
So thank you, and thank you all who are listening. And I hope that you can find a way to make music part of your life and part of your child's life. It will make a huge difference uh, and let them do it as long as they enjoy it in whatever fashion or way they enjoy it. Even if it's just playing a percussion instrument that already is gonna be, it's gonna make a big difference in the development. Let them, let them be loud. <laughs> right, and children love that, so. Well, they're cute for the first Instagram post and then you're like, okay, you know. <laughs> 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 you see that? Yes. Yeah, so thank you so much, Anna. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye bye.